Hello again. I am so excited to introduce Susan Thetherd, the second keynote speaker for this year's Critical Issues Forum. Susan is a nonfiction writer who has received the 2016 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the 2016 J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize for her book, Nagasaki, Life After Nuclear War. And I'm sure that uh, you all get a copy of the book. The Dayton Literary Peace Prize is the first and only annual US literary award recognizing the power of the written word to promote peace. J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize is an annual award given to a book that exemplifies literary grace, a commitment to serious research, and social concern. Her book, Nagasaki, has, uh, was also named the best book of the year by the Washington Post, The Economist, the American Literary Association, and the Kirkus Review. Nagasaki had book terrors the story of the 1945 atomic bombing of the city by focusing on five hibakusha, or atomic bomb survivors. Susan spent more than a decade researching and interviewing hibakusha and atomic bomb historians, physicians, and specialists to reconstruct the days, months, and years after the bombing. Using a powerful eyewitness account, Susan unveils this neglected story of the enduring impact of nuclear war. Published for the 70th anniversary of the bombing, Nagasaki expands our understanding of the atomic bomb and its impact and helps shape public discussion of one of the most controversial wartime acts in history. The book also received numerous praises from a major newspaper. For example, San Francisco Chronicle writes, Nagasaki is a devastating read that highlights man's capacity to wreak destruction, but in which one also catches a glimpse of all that is best about people. Mm -hmm. So I met Susan last November uh, at the United Nations Conference in Hiroshima, and I had the honor to share the same panel with her, and. Uh, also, I was, uh, Susan and I were sitting next to each other throughout the two days conference. So I had a <laughs> wonderful privilege to listen to her and uh, learn from her for those two days. Then I started thinking, maybe she, not maybe, she would be wonderful <laughs> to invite, you know, to give a talk to CIF students, especially given this year's topic. And I thought it would be very important for all of the CIF students to understand the actual impact of the use of nuclear weapons, especially human suffering of the hibakusha. So I am extremely delighted to have Susan right in front of you to give a talk about her book. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ms. Susan Southard. So can you hear me? Thank you so much, Masako. And I have to say it, it was my honor and privilege to not only serve on the same panel, but sit next to you for two days. And I learned so much. That's when I first learned about this program and was so inspired by it. And um, uh, although I was inspired at that time, it, it can't compare to having been here for the last two days with all of you. Um, you're absolutely amazing young men and women, and I'm grateful to know you and to hear your thoughtful and provocative and insightful and creative work over the last two days. Thank you so much. So yesterday I told you uh, uh, about uh, my being in high school uh, when I was about your age, I was 16 when I, when I uh, moved to Japan for 13 months to study there as an international exchange student. Um, and my, my uh, 
very brief visit to Nagasaki, which was a very pivotal moment in my life. And then there was a question that asked about another, uh, asked about other moments that really changed our lives. And I want to tell you about it, and it will come up later in my talk. Um, many years later, uh, after I finished high school, I was living in Washington, D.C., and I heard about a Nagasaki Hibaksha, uh, who we have all heard about a number of times. His name is Taniguchi Sumiteru. I use uh, the Japanese order of uh, people's names, which is the last name first. Uh, he was on a speaking tour of the eastern coast of the United States, and I somehow I heard about it, and I went to hear him speak. And I had never met or heard any hibaksha speak before, and I was mesmerized and awestruck by his story and by his, the way he presented himself. Um, I went up to him after the talk. I speak Japanese, not fabulously, but I speak Japanese, and I thanked him uh, very, very much and asked him a few questions. And I don't quite remember what happened, but the next morning I got a call asking if I could step in as his interpreter for his last two days in Nagasaki, which was kind of a, uh, it was a huge honor, and I immediately said yes, but it was also a very challenging uh, uh, invitation because I didn't even know how to say atomic bomb in Japanese, <laughs> much less radiation or hypocenter or many of the words that come up immediately um, in a story of a survivor. Uh, but Mr. Taniguchi's um, presentations were already written in Japanese and already translated into English, so when he paused, I could tell where he was in his speech by listening to him, and I could read the English translations. But the big change for me was that I was his chaperone, I was his driver, I had every meal with him, and all of our downtime, all of his time in between and in the evenings, he had no one else to spend time with. So I spent over 20 hours with him and got to ask him any questions I wanted, and he was very open and um, honest with me. And uh, we had these one-on-one -on -one conversations, and that is the moment that I wanted to share yesterday, but I knew I could tell you today instead about how that ultimately changed the course of my life. I didn't know that then. I, that was 1986. I um, went to, in the, the next year, in 1987, I went to Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I went to Nagasaki to visit Mr. Taniguchi, and I... Um, also uh, met other hibaksha, and I went to Hiroshima as well and met some hibaksha. Um, and <coughs> it was many years later, so let's see, like maybe 16 years or 17 years later, when I finally decided to write the book. But it was based on that experience with Mr. Taniguchi uh, and having spent that time with him because over the years between the time I met him and the time I decided to write the book, I kept thinking about him over and over again and the other survivors that I had met. And I thought, okay, I met him when he was 57. Okay, now he's 60. Okay, now he's in his mid-60s. Okay, now he's uh, getting close to 70 years old. Now he's in his 70s. What is it like for him and for the other survivors to look back on their lives that were split in two by nuclear war. That was my guiding question. That was the question I wanted to uh, understand that led me to, in 2003, begin uh, this book project, which um, I had no clue what I was getting myself into. It was, um, I wanted to tell the survivor's stories but I didn't know that it would take 12 years of um, travel, interview, translation, research, writing, and revising, and revising, and revising, and revising, and revising, <laughs> until it was ready for publication. And just so you know, it did come out, as Masako said, on the, uh, for the 70th anniversary of the bombing, 
But that was very lucky timing because I was three years late in getting my book finished for publication. And um, because it was late and because it came out uh, for the 70th anniversary, it was a very unexpected good fortune because it received um, media coverage not only across the United States, but across the world. I was interviewed by people in many, many countries all over the world um, uh, when the book came out. So as Masako said, um, Nagasaki Life After Nuclear War, and by the way, this is the, um, the paperback cover. They changed the cover, and I was very grateful because authors have no control over the cover of their books. And um, I really did not like the cover of the hardcover because it did not feel like it represented what was the con in the, in the uh, inside of the book, but I, I could not get them to change it. But when the paperback came, they came to me and said, we have a new design team and we want to design a new cover. And I was absolutely thrilled. This is a photograph from the Nation United States National Archives <coughs> from Nagasaki, um, uh, taken in the fall of 1945, a few months after the bombing, and it had um, just when I was told by my publisher that they were going to design a new cover, um, I uh, discovered that uh, a, an archivist in Nagasaki, for those of you in Nagasaki, it's um, Fukuhori Yoshitoshi-san, um, had gone to the National Archives and just discovered this photograph, so it's still not very well known in uh, Nagasaki. My book tells the story, as Masako said, of five survivors of the Nagasaki atomic bombing. There are two girls and three boys. They ranged in age from 13 to 18 at the time of the bombing. And the book follows their lives, not only in the days and weeks and months after the bombing, but also over the next 70 years. Um, and um, once I started the book, I was shocked to find out that no book in English had ever been written about the comprehensive story of survival after nuclear war. Um, we have a very famous book in this country by John Hersey called Hiroshima um, that was written in 1946 and it's still read today in high schools and colleges across this country, um, but it was written in 1946 and uh, it's a powerful book that has influenced many people um, but it, it covered the first, you know, six months after the bombing. And what about the next 70 and now 72, 73 years? Um, today, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a small glimpse of what some of the Hibaksha experienced. I'll do this in four parts. First, I'll tell you a little bit about what life was like in Nagasaki uh, before the bombing back in 1945. Then what happened right at the moment of the detonation of the bombing, of the bomb? I'll talk a little bit, I know um, we've already heard uh, from many of the pre presentations this, from, from all of you, some about, something about the long-term effects. I'll go into that a little bit more, um, about the radiation effects of the bombing. And finally, I'm going to introduce you to someone you've already been introduced to, uh, Mr. Taniguchi. Uh, who you've seen his photo, he's the, the man whose back was uh, burned off. Um, there are many, many survivor stories I could tell you, especially the other four. I chose him because he is very much in my uh, mind and heart right now because of his death last summer um, and because he was the first man, he was the uh, survivor who brought me to this story and to this book and ultimately to you. Um, so, I just want to say real quick, uh, raise your hand if you're from Nagasaki. Yeah, I, I just want to tell you how honored I am to have spent this much time uh, in, in your city and uh, working on this story, and uh, I hope I represent you well. Okay, so first I'd like to take you back to 1945 Japan where the narrative of nuclear war began. And ultimately, uh, in my theater work and in my writing, I'm a, I'm a storyteller. Um, although I didn't realize uh, in telling this story 
how much research I would need to tell it accurately and to tell it well. Uh, in August 1945, that was three years and eight months after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and the U.S. declared war on Japan. The Pacific War was long and grim, and Japan was relentless in its brutal military conquest of East Asia and many Pacific Island nations. Back at home, the Japanese people were starving, and the only news they heard about the war was government propaganda celebrating Japan's military successes, whether they were true or not. And although many Japanese people supported their nationalistic leaders, many others, including some of the survivors in my story, in, secretly, in secret, they desperately wanted the war to end. By that August, U.S. and Allied forces had decimated 64 Japanese cities with conventional and uh, incendiary, that's firebombing, attacks, killing an estimated 183,000 civilians. A few cities, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were spared as potential targets of the atomic bombs. Also, at that moment, the first phase of an allied invasion, <coughs> excuse me, land invasion of Japan was planned for November 1945. So all of you now are so knowledgeable, so I don't think I really need this, but there, there's, uh, there are four main islands of Japan. This is the main island of Honshu, where Tokyo and Hiroshima is toward the south. Nagasaki is on the southernmost main island called Kyushu, and Nagasaki is on the western coast, so it's pretty far from Tokyo. Um, it's 500 miles across the East China Sea from Shanghai and less than 200 miles from the South Korean peninsula. Um, for those of, you who, those of you who have never been, Nagasaki is an absolutely stunning city. Um, it is a port city. It has a long, narrow bay that juts into the coastline, and it has uh, mountains on three sides all around. Um, in 1945, the city's population was 240,000 people. This is an image of the Urakami Valley, which is the northern part of the city in 1945. It was filled with homes, shops, schools, and Mitsubishi factories. Here, do you see that church back there? That is, uh, it's now known as the Urakami Cathedral, but it, then it was called the Urakami Church. It was at that time the largest Catholic church in the Far East. About 20,000 Nagasaki citizens at that time were, were Catholic, and a majority of them lived in the Urakami Valley. The bomb, it's a little hard to tell from here, but fell somewhere, would you say, Nagasaki people right about there? Something like that, you think? Does that seem about right? It's about a mile and a half from where the photographer was standing. <coughs> Leading up to the bomb, on August 6, three days before the Nagasaki atomic bombing, the United States had dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And here, just for a moment, is where the three countries that all of you represent converge in this story. Because at midnight on the morning of August 9th, which was 11 hours before the Nagasaki atomic bombing, bomb was dropped, the Soviet Union joined the United States and its allies in the Pacific War by sending one and a half million troops into Japanese-held Manchuria. This broke a non-aggression pact between Japan and the Soviet Union, which terrified Japanese leaders into an emergency meeting in Tokyo that morning. That meeting started before the Nagasaki bomb was dropped, where, and at that meeting, the Japanese leaders were heatedly debating terms of surrender. This was before the bomb was dropped, and one thing that um, I researched really very um, heavily is that it's un, it's, there is no historical evidence that the Nagasaki bomb impacted uh, the Japanese leaders who were debating the terms of surrender that day. Uh, ultimately, they could not reach uh, agreement, 
and um, in the middle of the night, they went to the emperor's bunker uh, and, uh, and presented their arguments, and the emperor decided to uh, surrender. Um, but Nagasaki was, they heard the news about the bombing, but Nagasaki was not brought up in those discussions all day or evening or in the middle of the night. <clears throat> it was a hot summer morning in Nagasaki. Men, women, and children across the city were digging cave-like air raid shelters in the hillsides, hanging laundry, lining up at ration stations, and scouring the hills for weeds that they could boil into soup for their families. This is a photo of the five uh, survivors whose stories I tell in the book. Um, and uh, in Japan, by 1944, all students over the age of 14 were required to leave school and work for the war effort. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to each one and tell you what they did. Oops, sorry. This is Wada Koichi here. He was 18 at the time. Doesn't he look much younger? This might have been taken like a year before. Um, and he uh, worked as a streetcar driver. This is uh, Taniguchi Sumiteru, the man uh, who you'll hear more about later and who you've already heard about. Uh, Taniguchi was 16, and he worked as a postal delivery boy. He rode his bicycle through the hills of Nagasaki delivering mail. This is Nagano Etsuko. Nagano was 15 at the time of the bombing, and she worked in an um, airplane parts factory that was um, built uh, in a university gymnasium. Uh, this is Do Mineko-san. Uh, she was 16 at the time of the bombing, and she worked in a B Mitsubishi weapons factory um, where they produced um, torpedoes. And this is Yoshida Katsuji. Yoshida was only 13 at the time of the bombing, so he was still in school. You'll hear a brief mention of them, uh, each at the end of this excerpt that I'm going to read. It's 11.01 a.m., the moment when six miles above Nagasaki, the specially modified US B-29 bomber opened its bomb bay doors and released the bomb. This is a reading from the book. The five-ton plutonium bomb plunged toward the city at 614 miles per hour. 47 seconds later, a powerful implosion forced the bomb's plutonium core to compress from the size of a grapefruit to the size of a tennis ball, generating a nearly instantaneous chain reaction of nuclear fission. With colossal force and energy, the bomb detonated a third of a mile above the Urakami Valley and its 30,000 residents and workers. At 11.02 a.m., a super brilliant flash lit up the sky, visible as far away as Omoro Naval Hospital, more than 10 miles over the mountains, followed by a thunderous explosion equal to the power of 21,000 tons of TNT. The entire city convulsed. At its burst point, the center of the explosion reached temperatures higher than at the center of the sun, and the velocity of its shock wave exceeded the speed of sound. A tenth of a millisecond later, all of the materials that had made up the bomb converted into an ionized gas, and electromagnetic waves were released into the air. The thermal heat of the bomb ignited a fireball with an internal temperature of over 540,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Within one second, the blazing fireball expanded from 52 feet to its maximum size of 750 feet in diameter. Within three seconds, the ground below reached an estimated 5,400 to 7,400, excuse me, 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Directly beneath the bomb, infrared heat rays instantly carbonized human and animal flesh and vaporized internal organs. As the atomic cloud billowed two miles overhead and eclipsed the sun, the bomb's vertical blast pressure crushed much of the Urakami Valley. Horizontal blast winds tore through the region at two and a half miles, excuse me, two and a half times the speed of a Category 5 hurricane, pulverizing buildings, trees, plants, animals, and thousands of men, women, and children. <laughs> 
In every direction, people were blown out of their shelters, houses, factories, schools, and hospital beds, catapulted against walls or flattened beneath collapsed buildings. Those working in the fields, riding streetcars, and standing in line at ration stations were blown off their feet or hit by plummeting debris and pressed to the scalding earth. An iron bridge moved 28 inches downstream. As their buildings began to implode, patients and staff jumped out of the windows of Nagasaki Medical College Hospital and mobilized high school girls leapt from the third story of Shiroyama Elementary School, a half mile from the blast. The blazing heat melted iron and other metals, scorched bricks and concrete buildings, ignited clothing, disintegrated vegetation, and caused severe and fatal flash burns on people's exposed faces and bodies. A mile from the detonation, the blast force caused nine-inch brick walls to crack and cla glass fragments bulleted into people's arms, legs, backs, and faces, often puncturing their muscles and organs. Two miles away, thousands of people suffering flesh burns from the extreme heat lay trapped beneath partially demolished buildings. At distances up to five miles, wood and glass splinters pierced through people's clothing and ripped into their flesh. Windows shattered as far as 11 miles away. Larger doses of radiation than any human had ever received penetrated deeply into the bodies of people and animals. The ascending fireball suctioned massive amounts of thick dust and debris into its churning stem. A deafening roar erupted as buildings throughout the city shuddered and crashed to the ground. It all happened in an instant, 13-year-old Yoshida remembered. He had barely seen the blinding light half a mile away before a powerful force hit him on his right side and hurled him into the air. The heat was so intense that I curled up like surume, Gr dried grilled squid, he said. In what felt like dreamlike slow motion, Yoshida was blown backward 130 feet across a field, a road, and an irrigation channel, then plunged to the ground, landing on his back in a rice paddy flooded with shallow water. Inside the Mitsubishi Ohashi weapons factory, Do Mineko had been wiping perspiration from her face and concentrating on her work when Pato, an enormous blue-white flash of light, burst into the building, <clears throat> followed by an ear-splitting explosion. Thinking her torpedo had detonated inside the plant, Do threw herself onto the ground and covered her head and with her arms, just as the factory came crashing down on top of her. In his short sleeve shirt, trousers, gaiters, and cap, Taniguchi had been riding his bicycle through the hills in the northwest corner of the valley, when a sudden burning wind rushed toward him from behind, propelling him into the air and slamming him face down onto the road. <coughs> Excuse me. The earth was shaking so hard, he said, that I hung on as hard as I could so I wouldn't be blown away again. 15-year-old Nagano was standing inside an airplane parts factory, protected, to some degree, by distance and the wooded mountains that stood between her and the bomb. A light flashed, she remembered. Pika! Nagano, too, thought a bomb had hit her building. She fell to the ground, covering her ears and eyes with her thumbs and fingers, according to her training, as windows crashed in all around her. She could hear pieces of tin and broken roof tiles swirling and colliding in the air outside. Two miles southeast of the blast, Wada, the young streetcar driver, was sitting in the lounge of Hotarujaya Terminal talking with his friends. The train cables flashed. The whole city of Nagasaki was, the light was indescribable, he said. An unbelievably massive light lit up the whole city. A violent explosion rocked the station. Wada and his friends dived for cover under tables and other furniture. In the next instant, he felt like he was floating in, t in the air before being slapped down on the floor. Something heavy landed on his back, and he fell unconscious. Beneath the still-rising mushroom cloud, a huge portion of Nagasaki had vanished. Tens of thousands throughout the city were dead or injured. On the floor of Hotarujaya Terminal, 
Wada lay beneath a fallen beam. Nagano was curled up on the floor of the airplane parts factory, her mouth filled with glass slivers and choking dust. Do lay injured in the wreckage of the collapsed Mitsubishi factory engulfed in smoke. Yoshida was lying in a muddy rice paddy, barely conscious, his body and face brutally scorched. Taniguchi clung to the searing pavement near his mangled bicycle, not yet realizing that his back was burned off. He lifted his eyes just long enough to see a young child swept away like a fleck of dust. Sixty seconds had passed. So <clears throat> these are not the same photos you've seen, but you've seen a little bit about the aftermath. This is um, a photo um, taken of Nagas <coughs> of the Ur Urokami Valley area um, the day after the bombing. Uh, here is an air raid shelter. Um, unfortunately, there are some charred, burned bodies here and here and here. Um, uh, you can see these are the um, tracks of, I, th I think it's the railway, and that's one of the Mitsubishi factories uh, behind there. Um, uh, this is another photo taken a little bit later that day at uh, one of the temporary relief stations that were set up all over the city. As you can see, it's not much of a relief station, but these are uh, people who were still alive. And for some of you who haven't seen this photo before, these photos before, this is a US military photo of the um, area. Uh, it, this, what, this really wasn't the target. The target was um, not um, visible to the um, crew on the, on the B-29. Uh, this was dropped somewhere else. But this is a picture of the hypocenter area two days before the bomb, I think it's two days, two or three days before the bombing. And this is a uh, similar photo afterwards. So you can see that it was a, a, a completely populated, um, green, lush uh, area of the city. And here, there is nothing. Um, as some of you have already said in your presentations, the casualty count at the end of 1945 uh, with 74,000 dead, 75,000 more injured and irradiated. They became known, as you know, he as Hibaksha, atomic bomb affected people. The next er excerpt I'll read describes the first signs of radiation related illnesses in Nagasaki. By this time, Japan had surrendered, but the US occupation forces hadn't yet arrived in Japan. You'll hear the name of Dr. Akizuki he was a young physician and director of a 70-bed tuberculosis hospital in Nagasaki, and he is a secondary character in the book. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Within a week of the bombing, thousands of men, women, and children across Nagasaki and the, and the surrounding region began to experience inexplicable combinations of symptoms. High fever, dizziness, loss of appetite, nausea, headaches, diarrhea, bloody stools, nosebleeds, whole body weakness, and fatigue. Their hair fell out in large clumps, their burns and wounds secreted extreme amounts of pus, and their gums swelled, became infected, and bled. Purple spots appeared on their bodies, signs of hemorrhaging beneath the skin. Infections throughout the body were rampant, including the large intestine, esophagus, bronchial passages, lungs, and uterus. Within a few days of the appearance of their initial symptoms, many people lost consciousness, mumbled deliriously, and died in extreme pain. Others languished for weeks before either dying or slowly recovering. Even those who had suffered no external injuries fell sick and died. Fear gripped the city. As the pattern of symptoms, illness, and death became clear, that some people pulled on their hair every morning to see if their time had come. <clears throat> 
On August 15th, when Japanese scientists confirmed that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Nagasaki, that happens to be by the day, the day of uh, Japan's surrender, uh, physicians deduced that what appeared to be an epidemic killing their city was somehow related to radiation contamination. Contamination. This discovery was helpful in ruling out contagious diseases and other conditions, but it did nothing to minimize the mystifying, confusing, and terrifying truth about the invisible power of the bomb. People died koro 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 koro, one after another, their bodies cremated in fires across the city. Dr. Akizuki likened this, the situation to the Black Death pandemic that devastated Europe in the 1300s. From Akizuki's perspective, from his burned out hospital on top of Motohara Hill, death carved a clear geographical path. The first people who suffered and died from radiation related illness were living inside an air raid shelter at the bottom of the hill, closer to the hypocenter. The illness then climbed the hill, killing people in relative order according to their distance from the atomic blast. When the next tier of people grew sick, they were carried to the hospital grounds by their neighbors who lived farther up the hill, and the distance between the homes of the sick and his hospital became shorter and shorter. The Mayakawa family, the Matsuokas, and then the Yamaguchis were attacked by radiation sickness, Dr. Akizuki remembered. I named this widening advance of the disease the concentric circles of death. He watched as his neighbor, Mr. Yamaguchi, lost 13 family members from atomic bomb sickness. After each death, Mr. Yamaguchi carried the body to the cemetery, dug a grave, and called for the priest. After each ceremony, he returned home to care for the remaining family members, all of whom had fallen ill. They are dying one by one, he told Dr. Akizuki. Who will send for the priest when I am dying? Who will dig my grave? when I am gone. So I'm only going to mention briefly a little bit about the US, um, what was happening in the US in response to the bombing right at around this time. In the first weeks and months after the bombings, high level officials in the United States adamantly and publicly refuted news reports out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that large numbers of people were suffering and dying from radiation exposure. In late August and early September, for example, General Leslie Groves, director of the Manhattan Project where the atomic bombs were developed, tried to deflect public discussion about the bomb's radiation effects by insisting on the lawfulness of the bomb's use and their decisive role in ending the war. The atomic bomb is not an inhuman weapon, he stated in the New York Times. I think our best answer to anyone who doubts this is that we did not start the war, and if they don't like the way we ended it, to remember who started it. Later that year, General Groves testified before the U.S. Senate that death from high-dose radiation exposure is, quote, without undue suffering and a very pleasant way to die. So, um, the effects of radiation exposure did not end there, as, as you've heard from others um, who presented this weekend. Um, for every fact and, um, that, I, that I give you in my book, there are stories that, um, personal stories that illuminate uh, these realities. In the nine months after the bombing, pregnant women whose fetuses were exposed to radiation in utero suffered spontaneous abortions, stillbirths, and infant deaths, and many babies who survived birth developed physical and mental disabilities. And then, in 1948, three years after the bombing, leukemia and other cancer rates bega began to spike, killing countless more hibaksha and initiating a cycle of surging cancer rates that would last for decades. One survivor said it felt like he had been burned from the inside out. Adult hibaksha experienced job and marriage discrimination from employers and potential marriage partners who rejected them because of their long-term health prospects. 
Parents exposed to radiation at the time of the bomb feared not only for their own lives but for their children's, both those exposed to radiation at the time of the bombing and those born even long after because of the feared potential genetic effects from the parents' radiation exposure. Even today, radiation scientists are actively studying second and third generation hibaksha for genetic effects potentially passed to them from their parents and grandparents, reminding us how much we still don't know about the insidious nature of radiation exposure to the human body. Now I'd like to uh, introduce you to one of the survivors, Mr. Taniguchi. Um, and I hope that um, those of you who feel inclined will be able to read the book and um, get to know all of the survivors. They are each one unique, uh, funny, kind, flawed, uh, noble, courageous, afraid. They are um, really stunning and wonderful um, men and women, and I hope that you grow to love them as much as I do. So here we are. This is uh, Taniguchi Sumiteru, Sum uh, Taniguchi being his last name. He was the 16-year-old boy who was delivering mail uh, uh, on his bicycle in the hills in the northwestern corner of the city, about a mile from the hypo center. And a split second after the bomb detonated, the tremendous force and searing heat of the blast rushed at him from behind, blew him off his bicycle, and slammed him face down on the road. His entire back, skin, flesh, and muscle was burned off. This is a mile away, by the way. I mean, I said that, but I'm just re reinforcing that. Taniguchi lay on the ground, fading in and out of consciousness for two days and two nights before his grandfather finally found him. Over the next weeks and months, he was taken to one release station to the next, but with little or no medications available after the bombing, the burns that covered his back were treated with machine oil mixed with newspaper ashes. In November 1945, three months after the bombing, as the city was still reeling from the incomprehensible destruction and radiation effects, Taniguchi was finally taken to a naval hospital about 22 miles north of the city. And that's where this famous photo was taken that you've seen uh, in other presentations. It's become um, perhaps the most iconic photo um, out of Nagasaki. Um, there are others that are also very powerful of other survivors. So at this hospital, this was taken by a US military film crew that came in to assess the damages in January of uh, 1946 just after he turned 17, a few, a few days after he turned 17. Um, and he lay in that hospital bed for three years and four months. His since he always had to lie face down, his chest was covered with bed sores, creating holes so deep that doctors could see his beating heart. Every day, he begged his nurses to let him die. But... To the disbelief of his medical staff, Taniguchi was eventually able to move his legs, sit, and stand. He was finally released from the hospital in 1945, excuse me, 49. He was 20 years old and a foot taller than he had been when he entered the hospital. So lying there face down, he still grew a foot over the three years and uh, four months that he was there. For the rest of his life, his back was covered in thick car scar tissue, and he lived in constant pain. There's so many, 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 many rich moments in uh, Mr. Taniguchi's life, um, including what it was like for him to return to Nagasaki four years after the bombing um, and try to redefine what it meant to be alive at that time in his own life and in the life of the city. <clears throat> the painful dis discrimination that he faced. His injuries were not visible to the human eye, but um, uh, his family would reveal to potential, uh, to women who were potential marriage partners about his injuries, and they, they would reject him. And it was really hard for him until, uh, I won't tell you what happened about, uh, the story of his eventual marriage is one a, a very gripping and amazing story, so I hope you'll read that. 
Today, though, I'd like to focus on his activism. In the early 1950s, Taniguchi was struggling with the duality he felt as a, as, um, a hibakusha. He was good looking, he was a hard working man, and he was trying to create a normal life, whatever normal uh, could mean at that time. But beneath whatever clothes he wore, his physical scars caused him constant pain, and his anger toward both Japan and the United States brewed just beneath the surface. At that time, a new movement was forming in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, young hibakusha who wanted to tell their stories as a protest against the fierce nuclear arms race being waged between the United States and the Soviet Union. This movement gave Taniguchi a way to integrate his atomic bomb experiences into his everyday life. In 1956, at the age of 27, he began to tell his own story publicly, becoming, becoming one of Nagasaki's earliest anti-nuclear activists. In between numerous hospitalizations and surgeries on his back and arm, Taniguchi spoke out, first in Nagasaki, then throughout Japan and around the world, telling his story to countless students, adults, activists, and government leaders. Here is a photo of Mr. Taniguchi with Mr. Yoshida, the 13-year-old boy. You can't tell so well here how incredibly disfigured his face is. Um, uh, uh, it's not apparent. This is in, uh, in the early 60s it, uh, at a... Uh, nuclear disarmament conference in Hiroshima that they both went to. Uh, this is a photo of Mr. Taniguchi at the age of um, approximately 57, which is the same age when I met him, but this is at, a, at an anti-nuclear rally in Japan. Um, uh, but this reminds me a little bit of um, what he looked like when I first met him, although he smiled when we were together more often. As Taniguchi traveled the world, he found it's not like you all. You all are very unique in, I don't know about in your countries, because in Japan people know more about the hibakusha experience than other places, but people across this country and across the world don't know about the effects of nuclear weapons and the history of this uh, uh, post-war survival. Um, and that's what Mr. Taniguchi found over and over and over again, that people didn't know and didn't understand. And I think that's true even now, certainly in our country. Um, and people in our country and others see the atomic bombings as abstract events of the past, uh, military actions that ended the Pacific War. But for Hibakusha, as you all have heard today and throughout this weekend, there is nothing abstract about nuclear war. And for many, including Mr. Taniguchi, the war never ended. Here he is. Uh, you've seen other versions of this, uh, this image um, in other presentations. Um, this is uh, Mr. Taniguchi at the United Nations. Over 23 years, from 1982 to 2015, he traveled to New York six times to represent Nagasaki in international anti-nuclear marches and efforts. Um, uh, he would speak in a very hushed voice. Well, you heard him, uh, was it, um, uh, is it Shizuho? I'm sorry, who is the young woman who Um, when, you, when you played the video of Mr. Taniguchi in the hospital, he, he had a soft voice. And that, although he was very, very ill and dying at that time, he always had a very hushed voice and he kind of mumbled. It was hard to hear him. And, but he would speak with, he was soft-spoken, but he was very intense. Um, and he wanted people to understand the, impa the human impact of nuclear weapons and he wanted them to see the irony of building massive nuclear stockpiles in order to t deter nuclear weapons, excuse me, deter nuclear war. And he wanted to do anything he could to ensure that no one else ever went through the experiences that he and the people of his city did. This is a photo of the last time I saw Mr. Taniguchi. 
It was 2015, a few months after my book was published, when I went back to Nagasaki to thank the Hibaksha, their families, and all the people, the historians and the physicians and the researchers and the archivists who helped me um, uh, with my book. Here he is 86, which uh, he's the same age as my dad. My dad is three weeks older, I mean uh, younger. He's three weeks older than my dad. So you can see his hair was graying and deep vertical wrinkles rippled from the corners of his mouth. He had lost nearly all his vision in one eye and his memory was waning, though surely it wasn't gone. After more than 25 surgeries, including at least 10 skinned transplants on his back and left arm, the middle of his back near his spine was causing him the most pain, not on the surface, he said, but deep inside. When he stood or walked, his elbow remained permanently bent, and he couldn't raise his arm above shoulder level. More than half his body was still covered in scars. He was extremely thin, able to eat only small amounts of food, because if he ate any more, uh, the skin that was stretched tightly over his scars would crack open. But he was still fighting, even then, helping survivors apply for and receive government health care benefits for Hibaksha that he and others had fought so hard for, trying to expand these laws to provide further coverage for Hibaksha, <coughs> excuse me, and participating in national and global efforts to reduce and eventually abolish nuclear weapons throughout the world. And as you know um, from yesterday's presentation, Mr. Taniguchi was hospitalized last spring and he never returned home. He died last August, huh, just three weeks before the United Nations ratified the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty that had been no negotiated earlier last summer. And although clearly through all of the uh, amazing work you've done, you've pointed out some of the challenges and possible weaknesses of the, of the ban treaty, um, it, represented to Mr. Taniguchi and many Hibaksha a monumental historical moment. Um, and, uh, and he died just before that moment happened. The narrative of nuclear war that had begun in 1945 when Taniguchi was 16 continued the rest of his life as he spent, sorry, I'm going to start that again to try to make it better. The narrative of nuclear war had begun in 1945 when Taniguchi was 16, and he had spent the rest of his life trying to bring that narrative to an end. He had wanted so badly to see this moment of the nuclear ban treaty with his own eyes. In fact, the mayor of Nagasaki visited Mr. Taniguchi in the hospital five days before he died, and Taniguchi told the mayor that he was planning to go to New York City to attend the signing ceremony of the Nuclear Ban Treaty at the United Nations. Of course, he didn't make it, but his vision remains powerful and clear. He wanted more than anything else to ensure that Nagasaki is the last atomic bombed city in history. And isn't that what we all want? Each of us has many ways we can nourish life in this beautiful and broken world we live in. Already, all of you have contributed so much, far more than I ever did at your age. And I am so proud and inspired by you and so happy that our lives have intersected over this weekend. And my hope for all of us is that we may continue to take care of ourselves and each other and continue with courage and humility there's that word humility, who, <laughs> um, to speak our truths on behalf of all life on this planet we call home. Thank you.